It's easy to look back through history and trace a straight line of technological progress to this point. Like a freight train of awesome, just barreling toward Tomorrowland. In reality, sometimes change brings struggle. But we keep advancing, keep adapting, keep searching for that next thing because exciting discovery feeds the soul. To advance, at once, as one, on target, on top, and on to the next one, the next page, the next stage, to boldly go together as a community, creating the tech of tomorrow with the wisdom of yesteryear. Red Hat Summit 2014, what's next? Gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO of Red Hat, Jim Whitehurst. Oh. Wow. Wow, this is amazing. It's incredible to see so many people here. Wow, it's our first time in San Francisco. This is our 10-year anniversary of the Red Hat Summit. And so thank you for celebrating it with us. This is my seventh summit since I've been at Red Hat, and to watch the growth that we've had, the interest in Red Hat, and as importantly, the growth in open source and the interest in open innovation is truly extraordinary. Raise your hands if this is your first summit. Wow, that's amazing. Well, welcome. I hope you'll find that, that a Red Hat Summit is different than any other vendor show that you might go to. I'm gonna talk a little more in a few minutes about our mission statement, but our mission statement starts off to be the catalyst in communities of contributors, customers, and partners. So you are all part of our mission statement, and I hope that shows through in what we try to accomplish uh, during our summits. And so it's phenomenal to have you all here. Technology is advancing it's such an extraordinary rate. And I know people say that, but in preparing for the summit this year, I went back and looked at my keynote from last year. And I looked at where things were, whether that was with OpenStack or even with Linux or so many of the other cloud technologies. And I look and think, well, that must be from five years ago. Right? The pace of innovation really is exploding and we're seeing it across technology, again, whether that's cloud, whether that's big data, mobile, social, et cetera. It's extraordinary to see the pace of technology and what's happening. So the theme this year is advance. We wanna talk about how we as an industry continue to move forward. And I'll talk in detail in a few minutes, but when I say we as an industry, it's not what Red Hat's doing, it's not what any one vendor's doing, and it's not what any one user's doing, it's how together we're going to advance in, in this industry. You know, normally on Thursday of the keynotes, uh, or Thursday of the summit, we get together and we talk about the Innovation Award winners. But when we look at how fast technology is changing and the importance of innovation that we're all looking to drive, this year we decided to integrate the Innovation Awards uh, into my keynote. And so, as you know, every year we have a set of categories where we give Innovation Awards. And those are in infrastructure, emerging technologies, ecosystem and knowledge exchange, what we call accelerate, integrate, and automate, and application development. And I'd like to highlight 
some of those winners and what they're doing through the course of my keynote. So you'll hear more about those. Now, what we do is those are winners in categories. I'm getting ready to show you the names of those winners and congratulate them. But over the course of the week, you'll have a chance to vote on which of these case studies, which of these uh, users or innovators will be innovator of the year. And so you'll have opportunities to vote through the course of the week. The winners in those categories are Chris, which is the Center for Railway Information Systems in India, Nanyang Technical University, Hennepin Home Healthcare, OSDL, Benario, and Cetisol. And again, through my keynote, you'll hear uh, some videos and some audio of what some of these customers are doing and how they're using open source technologies to define their own future infrastructure. So again, at, you'll hear this, you'll have an opportunity to hear more about the case studies, and I strongly encourage you to cast your votes and we'll see who the winner is. Technology today it is truly moving at an extraordinary pace. It's amazing to watch. If you just look at the pace of the underlying technologies, you know, Moore's Law continues to march forward uh, at its normal pace. If you look at Kreider's Law or Butter's Law that govern you know, basically similar laws for storage and network, they continue to march forward at extraordinary pace. I would argue even more profound is the move we are seeing to what I'll call the industrialization of IT. Right, as IT moves from being custom applications that start maybe all the way down to the chip level, but certainly at the hardware level up through the application. As we move from that to common commoditized modular standard infrastructure and applications that are then built to run on that infrastructure, we're seeing truly an explosion in the speed and the functionality that we're seeing in applications around us. Something we've never seen before. It's the reason we see things like big data emerge. Right? No longer is it about building a true custom stack from the bottom up. It's about a common infrastructure on which applications can be built. And that's leading to just a massive explosion in the speed and pace of innovation. And for traditional enterprises, it's now about how do you keep the lights on? How do you run your traditional apps or your kind of stateful traditional apps and at the same time tap into the pace of this innovation? Right? And when I say innovation, I'm not just talking about technology. As you all know, and one of the things I hope we'll have an opportunity to have a dialogue on through the sessions over the next few days, it's, not, it's about technology, but it's also about systems, it's about processes, it's about culture. Because changing the way we develop and run applications is much more than just the underlying technologies. I ended my keynote last year by making the statement a technology choice today is a choice of the innovation model that you're choosing to build your next generation infrastructure on. And what I was specifically talking about is, do you want to build your technology on a traditional proprietary stack? Or do you believe in the power of the open innovation model? Do you believe that any single vendor can do the same as, as a broad industry coalition of vendors and users could do together, right? Do you believe that the power of cloud can be harnessed by one company? Can one company hire an engineering team, a CTO in an organization that can guess where all the future of technology is going? Or given the rate of change, do you want to bet on a vibrant community of people working together, of vendors, of users, practitioners and visionaries working together? And I articulated, well, that obviously the open innovation model was superior. And I want to come back and talk a little bit more through my talk today about how Red Hat works to help you consume that technology. And that's going to be the theme I would like to talk about today. But before I do that, I just want to give you one example of what I mean at the power of open innovation. I want to, uh, so our, uh, our mission statement is to be the catalyst in communities of customers, contributors, and partners building technology the open source way. And I'm going to start off talking about the beginning of that catalyst in communities of customers, contributors, and partners. Right? One of the key things we work to try to do is ensure that the technologies we bring are 
technologies that have the richest ecosystem of innovation happening. And just to pick one example that most of you I'm sure have heard of today, but I bet 95% of people had, of you had not heard of this last year, Docker and the power of containers as a new way to build, distribute, and manage applications. I'll be honest, when I did my keynote last year, I went back and I went through all kind of detailed notes about what we saw and what we thought were gonna happen in the future. Didn't even know what Docker was at the time. And the idea that uh, container and con containerization of applications uh, could get the kind of traction that it's gotten never crossed my mind. Now maybe somewhere within Red Hat it had crossed someone's mind, but it certainly hadn't risen to anything that I'd heard about. Over the last less than 12 months, that community has gone from zero to over 350 contributors, driving a whole new way to develop and deploy applications. But the important part here is, while Red Hat didn't predict it, what Red Hat did do is ensure that we've been involved in the appropriate communities of innovation that are happening. And so if you've made a bet on Red Hat and our technologies, you've made a bet not that we can guess where technology's going, but that we've chosen the communities of innovation that are occurring, and so those things are happening in our ecosystem. You'll hear a lot more about some of the things we're doing uh, with Docker and more broadly on containers over the next several days. But importantly, it's not Red Hat running to catch up. It's that innovation happening in the open e ecosystem. And by choosing an open versus proprietary ecosystem, you inherit the benefits of innovation that's happening, not at Red Hat, but broadly in open communities around the world. Now, similar types of innovation are happening not just in containers, but across most of the major growth areas in information technology. So cloud, big data, you know, mobile, kind of a whole new range of, of cloud applications. Um, and this is not just about the technology. It's also about the methodologies with which these applications are written and deployed. So trends like DevOps or continuous delivery. Again, I'm not up here trying to say, listen to Red Hat because we have it figured out. That's not the point. The point is, be involved in an ecosystem, an open ecosystem, where thought leaders, where the large IT users and vendors are working together in the same ecosystem to figure that out. And you inherit that benefit. And that's what we're really working to do. Now, in terms of talking about what Red Hat brings to the table, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about choosing the right ecosystems of innovation to be involved in. But it's also about how do you actually take that innovation and drive it through into your traditional uh, IT stacks. I have the pleasure uh, of traveling around the world and meeting with CIOs around the world on you know, in talking to them about their key strategic issues. And one of the biggest single issues I have is, I love all this cool new technology out there, but I have a massive infrastructure that I gotta run today. And these are stateful apps, right? These are traditional scale-up type applications, and how do I think about managing that in the context of all this change that we're seeing happening out there? And you'll hear a lot of analogies, uh, and the same ones you hear around the world, these are pretty universal. You know, you gotta change the tire while the bus is moving, or you gotta change the engine on the plane while it's in flight. And those are good visual analogies of what's going on. Unfortunately, I've never heard of somebody changing a tire while a bus is driving, or changing an engine certainly while a plane's in flight. But for those of you who didn't raise your hand before, you know I'm a little bit of a student of history. And I really do try to look back at historical analogs to provide context and lessons learned for today. So I couldn't go back and look for historical analogs for changing a tire or an engine on an airplane. But when I thought about what would be a good analog to go back and look at, lessons learned for how to take an existing infrastructure and augment with new, Start thinking about transportation systems and cities, right? A traditional city, you have a whole set of logistics associated with running it, but cities are growing and changing and you need to augment and add to it. 
And then you start saying, well, let me look at what cities have done around transportation and how they've changed over time. So the first example I want to talk about, I'm going to take you back a little bit before the Industrial Revolution here. I'm going to take you back to September 2nd, 1666. It's a random date. Well, on September 2nd, 1666, at a bakery, Charles Trainer's Bakery, if you want to, I always hate to put name because that's always assigning blame, but he's well long since dead. So Charles Trainer's uh, at his bakery uh, did not put out the fire appropriately. This is on Pudding Lane in London. The bakery caught fire, and over the next just few hours, all of London went up in flames, known as the Great Fire of London. In fact, it got so hot, I thought this was a cool factoid. I love cool factoids, I'm a geek that way. It got so hot that the lead roof of St. Paul's Cathedral literally melted. Now, why do I bring this up? As horrific as that was, by the way, very few people died. Luckily, most people got out, but as horrific as that was, one could look as an analogy, it's kind of a cool thing to look at. How many CIOs have I talked to who say, if I just didn't have all this installed base, think of the cool things that I could do. All right, now you have a city with no installed base. And at the time, there were phenomenal designs that were developed around how London could rebuild with broad, wide vistas, uh, with plazas, piazzas, to rival Paris or some of the great cities of the rest of Europe. And for those of you who know something about history, the short answer for what happened was King Charles II said, can't afford it. We're just going to rebuild on the existing infrastructure. That's actually not quite right. What actually happened is as the plans were being drawn up for how to remodel London in a much more modern, open way, which would make it a fundamentally different city than it is today, myriad constituencies arose. How do you handle property rights of people? Different people thought, well, if I do this, I'm going to profit a little more doing that. And it was expensive. By the time you added it up, it got to be such a hassle that in the end, London rebuilt on its existing infrastructure. And the congestion taxes and the issues that London faces today are a result. Now, I love London. It's one of my favorite cities. But if any of you have been stuck in taxis for hours in London know, wow, wouldn't it have been great if they had done something different? What I find interesting about that is how many CIOs do I talk to who say, got a brilliant idea, I may be willing to fund it, but I have so many different constituencies with a narrow view of the world, and in this case, the people who have the property rights or the people who have um, you know, a specific way they, th they thought they were going to profit on London, and the whole thing fell apart. And to some extent, CIOs have that same issue. Right? Even when given an opportunity to do something in Greenfield, the number of constraints and the number of constituencies to manage is really, really hard. So now I had my team look and say, okay, well, there's a good example most people know about the Great Fire of London, but let's talk about a city who's done it really, really well because there have got to be some great lessons to learn from a city who's really done it well. Unfortunately, I have some sobering news for you. It was really, really, really hard to find a city that had done a really good job of managing their existing infrastructure, but also writing and planning for the future. It's hard. And so I'm not up here to say that it's easy. It's difficult. It's going to be difficult for any IT department in the same way to say, how do I take running what I'm doing today, but also access the innovation of the future? I did have a city, and I have to, do have to put it up here, because the winner is... This is Copenhagen. Is there anybody from Copenhagen here? All right. I see one, one person waving their hand. So hopefully you'll agree with this. If you actually look, Copenhagen has done a pretty phenomenal job of managing growth and building infrastructure. That's pedestrian walkways, that's public transportation, that's roadways to really, really manage uh, its growth and, and, and its uh, infrastructure. So you say, well, what did... Copenhagen do well that other cities have it. And I have three hypotheses. The first is, you may or may not know this, Denmark is a constitutional monarchy. And I got to tell you, I've had a lot of CIOs say to me, if I were king, I would do blah, 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 and I'd make it work. And maybe that's true, but let's be honest, CIOs are rarely kings. So the second hypothesis here 
This was actually uh, an idea that came from Deepak Avandi from IBM, who's speaking next. Um, he's going to be a phenomenal keynote, so definitely stick around for that. And his logic was, well, if you think about Copenhagen, one of its most prominent features, one of its most famous features is Tivoli Gardens. And he says, well, maybe anything that's that, anything in infrastructure that's that close to Tivoli must run well. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions uh, on that. No, in all seriousness, the only thing I can came, come up with was decades of hard work. Hard work, eye on the prize, people working together, collaborating, trying to drive the new solution. There is no simple answer for how you continue to manage the old and move to the new. And if any single vendor is telling you, here it is and here's the roadmap, be careful. And it's not just that it's hard to do in any one case, it's that there's no one size fits all. In the same way that every city is different, Every IT infrastructure is different. There is no one proscribed answer for how a company needs to innovate or a way that it can change its own infrastructure. On that note, let's hear from a couple of our innovation award winners on how they've thought about the problem. It's interesting to see a common theme across these, which is basically, how do you take advantage of that innovation in a world that's hard to see, and at the same time do it in a way where when you put it in production, that you get the reliability, uh, the consistency, and the stability that you need. This same challenge that I talked about with cities of managing and driving innovation while also continuing to manage and live and uh, both cost and performance of the existing is something that every enterprise faces. Right? How do you predict and deliver against the changing needs of your user base? How do you determine what innovations are going to stick and which ones are going to fade away? Right? How do you continue to deliver uh, existing services while upgrading for the future? Right? Basically, in short, how do you keep the traffic moving today while you're building the, the future infrastructure you need for tomorrow? And it's actually even more difficult today than it was because the innovation we're seeing is no longer spoon-fed by one vendor. Right? Last year when I talked about the power of open innovation, I talked about the power of hundreds or thousands of people working together, about how users, massive IT users, the Googles and Amazons, Facebooks, LinkedIn and Twitters of the world are driving their own destiny in open source. But what I also talked about is those companies aren't writing this code. They're not driving this innovation for enterprise uses. They're driving it for their own needs. So when you start thinking about how do you drive, how do you think about this level of innovation, how do you build it into your own IT futures when there is no one vendor to go point at and say, what's my upgrade path? How do I do this? This is when you truly need a partner who can help you make sense of that innovation and help you then ultimately drive it into your infrastructure. Red Hat strives to do both. First, help you access or be the innovation, be involved in the innovation, catalyze those communities. And I want to spend a minute talking about this, because I talked a lot about this last year, about the power of open innovation. But what I, feedback, frankly, I got back was, OK, that's great. But what exactly role is Red Hat playing in it? So let me start off with the first point. And I, I started off talking about 
our mission statement. Let me focus on the first half, to be the catalyst in communities of customers, contributors, and partners. Now, what does that really mean? What it means is we strive to be involved in the communities where we find the richest, most powerful innovation happening. Again, less of a value judgment about what's the best technology and much more of a value judgment from us around what are the best architectures of participation. Now let me, talk, let me just show you a few examples of that. I talked a little bit about Docker, which happened in our ecosystem. But a, another obviously great example is OpenStack. So OpenStack is a project we got involved with a couple years ago that we really do see as the future of infrastructure as a service. And again, we've become involved. We're by far the largest contributor now to OpenStack. But importantly, we chose that. We became involved in the community and we're working to drive it. Less because where we thought OpenStack was two years ago and much more because of the power of the community. Users involved, vendors involved. And, and in this case, we're looking to bring this to you as an enterprise project. Let me take a different one. Software-defined networking, obviously a long-term uh, area for innovation that holds massive, massive potential. So in this case, this isn't a product, but Red Hat gets involved early in the communities we see with the most uh, potential. So Open Daylight is a SDN consortium that was founded uh, less than two years ago, and already it won Interop's Best of SDN Categories uh, and the Grand Award, the Best of All Categories, just a few weeks ago. This isn't a product yet, but these are areas that Red Hat works to get involved in and starts catalyzing communities well before we're ever actually going to deliver a product. And as that community develops and as that technology materializes, we hope to be good contributors to that project, bringing the needs that you have into those technologies. And over time, if and when it becomes ready, and we think becomes robust enough and the community's reached the point, then again, we can move it to the next level. Now let me show you a completely different community, one that we don't directly work with as a, as a product, Hadoop. Obviously, Hadoop is a core, core product, project in big data. And the potential for big data and what can be done with Hadoop is massive. So from a Red Hat perspective, we are involved in this community. We're involved in the community to make sure we can give you a storage layer that can go beyond uh, Hadoop, so you can use your operational store to run Hadoop. We're working hard to make sure Hadoop works well with a whole set of middleware tools so you can pull uh, data in a way that you're, that's consistent and that you're used to from other data sources. And importantly, we're working broadly with the community to make sure it runs on OpenStack. So when you look at a new project like Hadoop, we want to make sure that you can run it on your next generation infrastructure. So again, this isn't a product that we are looking to commercialize. It's how we can get involved in communities to serve you. In this case, it's not to serve you to deliver you a product, but it's to serve you to make sure that the other projects and products that you are interested in will work long term in our infrastructure. So, that's the first half of what we do, ensure that we're involved in the appropriate communities where innovation's happening, so you can confidently know that with a partner at Red Hat, we're continually making sure we're involved in the communities that you care about and where the best innovation's happening. But there's a second key part of what we do, and it's around helping you consume these technologies. Don't confuse the innovation model with the consumption model. And what I mean by that is when we look at the best innovation communities, they're frankly the most chaotic. They're where you have hundreds or thousands of people contributing, where you have tons of different ideas pulling it and ripping it in multiple directions. And bluntly, some of our competitors will observe that and use that to sell against open source. They'll say, OpenStack, there are 20 different distributions of OpenStack and there are hundreds of people, it's chaotic. Yes, and that's why innovation's happening and innovation's happening so quickly. We strive to help you consume those products in a consumable, 
stable, supportable way. Look at Linux. Linux is the single most chaotic open source project out there. Thousands of contributors, strong opinions pulling it multiple directions, hundreds of distributions. But frankly, some of the most mission critical systems in the world run on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Stock exchanges, trading platforms, nuclear submarines, things that are way too mission critical to even virtualize are running on Red Hat Enterprise Linux on top of an innovation model that's the most chaotic in the world, which is our second part of our mission statement, creating better technology the open source way. We strive to bring you that level of stability so we can take the, the mass chaos and make it consumable for our enterprise customers. Let's hear a little bit again from our innovation award winners, their thoughts on how they're consuming Red Hat's technologies. If we chose to not innovate, we would get swallowed up by the competition. Si vos no estás preparado para cambiar a la velocidad que cambia el negocio, seguramente llegas tarde, digamos, y no das el servicio que tienes que dar. Para nosotros es bastante importante la innovación, dado que nos permite conseguir la reducción de costos y eso nos permite seguir invirtiendo de alguna manera en nuevos proyectos. Reliability and security and agility. Put the and in all uppercase letters and make the font a little bit bigger and bold it, underline it, italicize it. You got to have all three. Hoy día en México yo no veo ningún otro proveedor que nos pueda ofrecer la apertura en, en cuanto al código reutilizable que como la tiene Red Hat. Open source technology gives us innovation, faster solution, and is cost saving. The Red Hat solutions have provided a cost-efficient, scalable, and innovative way to allow a unified management of a hybrid environment. Nosotros creemos que podemos, tenemos hoy la capacidad de tomar información en tiempo real de cómo están todos los procesos y si hay que cambiar cosas, las cambiamos en el momento. With Red Hat and their knowledge and what they bring to the table here, I feel we are more than capable and set for the future. So what we hear over and over again from our innovation award winners, but more broadly from enterprise IT customers, is that change continues to accelerate. And the ability to confidently address that change, to continue to innovate, but do it in a way and still meet the reliability and scalability requirements that traditional enterprise customers have is a challenge. We are in a once in a decade paradigm shift in IT architectures. And from an infrastructure point of view, when we think about those architectures, none of us want to be London. I hate to insult London, I really do love London. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. But from an infrastructure perspective, we don't want to rebuild a new architecture on the same lines that our prior architecture was built. You need to manage what you have but you do need to build an architecture that it does enable you to change and allows for continuous improvement, that leverages open user-driven innovation, right? The power of mass collaboration and ensures that you have access to the latest innovations. We don't have all the answers at Red Hat. I'm not up here to say, trust Red Hat, we'll hold your hands, we'll get you through it all. But what we are saying is collectively, the people in this room and more broadly, the industry has those answers. No one vendor has those answers, right? It's a combination of the visionaries and the practitioners, right? The users, the vendors, the partners, the service providers, all working together to bring their components together, which will ultimately figure out this morass of the world we live in and the world we're looking to go uh, to. And so we use the term all hands on cloud and it really is going to take the entire industry working together to drive this new change. Again, there's no one vendor who's defined cloud computing. It's the very fact that it isn't one vendor, that it's users and vendors and, and service providers and others working together to bring this, uh, this about. That means we all need to work together uh, to make this change possible. The next few days is exactly about that. It's about participation. It's about having a dialogue and it's about working together. 
Sure, we have a lot of sessions and we have a lot of partners who are doing sessions, and hopefully those serve as the catalyst for dialogues that you have. But if there's one thing I can encourage you to do, it's meet new people, it's share an idea. Let's get the dialogue started. Let's it really truly advance together. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our next uh, keynote speaker, Deepak Avandi. I have to say, Deepak lives about a mile from where I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I only see him on a coast, normally the West Coast. So um, he is uh, a phenomenal partner. Uh, he's been a great friend of mine. Uh, from uh, IBM, this is, I think the, I don't know, the 10th year in a, a row that they've been our lead sponsor. So please give a warm welcome to Deepak Avandi. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, and you know, by the way, he mentioned Tivoli. So I became the general manager of the Tivoli division. Uh, and one of the uh, things that teams educated me on is Tivoli. There's another bit, bit of trivia here. Tivoli, Tivoli spelled backwards is what? I love it. They told me it's I love it, and I love that because what I really believe is life is all about passion. Whatever you work on, you better be passionate about it. And for me, another thing that I love is being here with all of you today at the 10th anniversary of this event because I remember back in, um, it was 1999, I was actually the first director of Linux strategy at IBM. And I still remember all the conversations we were having in Armonk as to, wait a minute, this thing is free? It's developed by open source? We don't control what's going on with the OS? And people are going to put this in the enterprise? Yep. And the fact that we're here 10 years uh, later, I mean 15, 14 years later, it is just a thrill for me to be here and to be at this event uh, with Red Hat. What I would like to do over the next 30 minutes or so is share with you IBM's point of view as to where we see things going, why this partnership with Red Hat is so important to us, and on cloud in particular, how do we see things evolving? So first of all, we do studies, right? Every year we talk to CFOs, we talk to CMOs, we talk to CEOs. Which factors are influencing your company and your industry the most? And for many, many years, like you know, in the 2006, 2007, 2008, what we kept hearing is the number one factor, market factors, GDP, inflation, demand. How am I going to deal with all these factors, right? But now, last couple years in a row, the CEOs are saying the number one factor is technology. It's technology. Technology is driving a lot of change. It's creating opportunities to build a competitive advantage. Maybe the only thing that can enable companies to build a competitive advantage. And when you think about it, look, I've been in the industry a couple decades. I don't remember a time when there was this much disruption happening all at once. Whether it's mobile, social, you know all about big data, analytics, cloud, it's all around us, and it is creating enormous opportunities for companies to seize a competitive advantage. IBM's point of view. Three things we are putting a lot of focus on. Three things, data and analytics is one. Cloud, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And then engagement. So far as big data and analytics, look, there is so much data getting generated. All I don't have to quote any numbers. You've seen all this stuff. There's tons of data. Structured, unstructured. Data in motion, data at rest. You've got data within your enterprise that you could actually analyze to get some insights. But there's tons outside your enterprise that particularly when you connect it with the data you have within your enterprise can give you tremendous insights opportunities are enormous. I would argue in any industry, any decision can be made better through the use of data and analytics, and we are seeing proof points happening all over the place. So analytics, whether it's descriptive, predictive, prescriptive, or cognitive, I'm telling you the next frontier 
is cognitive computing. And to me, it's so interesting because you see use cases every day. People can serve customers better, they reduce churn, they do better customer retention. Those use cases are great. What I really get excited about is when I have a partnership with the New York Genome Center, and they're gonna work with us to find a better cure for cancer, for brain cancer to be precise. Think about it, all these physicians, there's so much information out there, they don't have time to even digest all that stuff, let alone make better treatment based on all the latest research. We are talking about very, very accurate diagnosis, and we're talking about personalized treat treatment based on genetics. We are gonna see a lot of new innovation because of analytics. Then when you talk about engagement, think about how all of us buy things today. We don't listen to advertising as much as we mention to someone we trust. Who reads documentation today? If something doesn't work, you go online, figure it out. The way we buy, the way we get support, and the way we respond when things don't go the way we want them to go. Everything is changing. But again, it's creating a lot of opportunity for vendors and for companies. Five minutes is the response time that people expect. We are living in an instant gratification world, and this, again, is creating tons and tons of opportunity. And this is where we're putting a lot of investments. Now, let's talk a bit about cloud. I really wanted to focus a little bit more on cloud for this talk. So cloud, first of all, is open up tremendous, it's opening up tremendous possibilities for business leaders. Business leaders are the ones who are at the front lines and also the back office, but they need to move with greater speed or you get left behind. It could be talking about coming out with new offerings. You know, we keep talking about DevOps, but even in line of business, they gotta get something out there. It may not be perfect, I don't care. I wanna embed analytics, I wanna learn as, as I go, and I wanna adjust, I wanna adapt, I wanna constantly tune. They gotta move with speed. They gotta move with speed. Cloud enables them to do a lot of things that before they couldn't do. Because now you're in this world of speed and agility. And one of the other things we hear, because over the last four or five years, we've built a lot of solutions for line of business. Marketing, we've got, because you know, again, a lot of it through acquisitions, and then we added uh, organic capabilities. Unica, Core Metrics, t -Lead, Demand Tech for price optimization, adding analytics into everything we do for marketing. For, for risk officers, we've got solutions. So every line of business, HR, what we are seeing more and more is line of business would say, IT, you're not moving fast enough for me. So I'm gonna go procure some services that I need directly. And what we're starting to see is the pendulum shifting. So now line of business is telling IT, I still need that speed, I still need that agility, but be the broker. Because I don't wanna have to deal with governance. I don't wanna deal with security. I don't wanna deal with all these vendor negotiations. So now line of business is saying, I gotta move at speed, but a partner with IT. Now IT, what's going on with IT? If you look at every IT organization, I'm telling you, for the last decade or more, they are not seeing their budgets go up through the roof. They're being asked to do more with less. 70% of IT budgets are there just to keep the lights on. And then they're being asked by line of business, move faster, move faster, let's go. Cloud is opening new possibilities for IT managers. Why? Because of virtualization, by the way, not just for compute, we're talking storage, we're talking networking like Jim was talking about, software-defined environments, software-defined data center, enabling you to get greater efficiencies out of what you have through consolidation and through optimization of your workloads. It's freeing up the resources that are enabling you to invest in innovation. On the innovation front, cloud is enabling you to move with greater speed. We'll talk a bit about how you can start composing applications instead of writing from scratch which brings us to the third key constituent, developers. Boy, I tell you, if I had to make a bet over the next several years, it's going to be this kingmaker thing coming through. Developers are gonna be more and more the most important constituent within an enterprise. They are the ones who are gonna decide which technologies get deployed. They're the ones who are gonna decide which APIs to actually publish and use and consume. The world is going to move more and more towards developers. And again, when you think of cloud, what they're enabling developers to do is compose applications using APIs. And what they'll be able to do with DevOps is get something out they don't have 
the time to wait for 12 months to get a new release out the door, you're talking about days and weeks. So now you also need to give a lot of flexibility, the whole continuum. To some, they want to have direct access to the infrastructure, whether it's using OpenStack APIs that I'll talk a little bit about, or I just want to compose my application using point and click platform as a service, all the capabilities. And again, what we'll talk a bit about is the importance of standards and openness as we move to this world. So again, our point of view, the future is composable business. When line of business, developers, and IT work together to move with greater speed, just like when we think of composing applications using APIs, these APIs are enabling companies to build new business models, to come up with new offerings, really deconstruct their business processes into atomic units that they can then reconstruct for a new business model. Every business process is getting instrumented with analytics so you make better decisions. Again, a lot of this is being dictated by the need to move with greater speed. So future composable business. Now, in order to get to compo composable business, our point of view, dynamic cloud. Of course, it's hybrid, public, private, but it all starts with workloads, first of all. But a dynamic cloud is one that adapts to the changing business needs the ability to move workloads to the environment that is best suited at that given time. Adaptive, responsive, hybrid cloud, we believe is key, uh, critical to a composable business. And in order for this to become real, open standards become absolutely fundamental. I would argue without open standards, some of these other things are just not possible. And it doesn't matter which layer you're talking about, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, all these standards become really important. That's why you see us here at the Red Hat Summit. That's why you see us talking about OpenStack so much. But it's not just that. We're talking about for patterns using Oasis and Tosca or Chef. Uh, not everything has to be you know, a de facto de jour standard. Standards is where communities come together and vendors agree to do things in a standardized way. OpenStack we'll talk more about. And even things like link data and OSLC, when you start talking about DevOps, a key part of DevOps is automation. But the ability to link a lot of tools together through link data is absolutely critical. So we believe that standards will become increasingly important in this space. And then again, what do standards give you? Clearly to our clients, right, they give you a choice. Look. I've been in the industry for a while, right? I remember I started all my programming days with Unix. I'm a VI guy, I'm old school. Of course, I started back in college with Assembler a little bit, but I'm a C and VI guy. I still remember when, you know, from Unix, back in the 90s, NT came along. And people said, oh, that's it for Unix. NT will rule. Some of you are probably too young to remember that. But then after that came Linux. And, what I've seen in the industry is when something new comes along, the old doesn't always go away. The world is heterogeneous, and we believe the world in the foreseeable future will continue to be heterogeneous. Giving clients choice is really important. Interoperability is really important. And again, speed of innovation becomes really important. One of the reasons why Linux has done so well is because the rate and speed with which communities innovate are always going to win compared to a model that is more proprietary. Look, no matter how great a vendor is, you can only get so many smart people within that enterprise. Compared to having people coming together because they want to work on something, boy, I tell you, they're going to win hands down. We've seen it happen, and we're going to continue to see it happen going forward. That's why we're such big believers in it. In fact, another example of our support for open standards is something that you may not expect, open power. So this is sort of a chip system software ecosystem. Think, so when you think of people who are building servers today, who do you think of? You're probably thinking, oh, I got you know, HP, maybe IBM, Dell, Cisco. How about Google? How about Facebook? More and more companies are building custom servers because the workloads that they're running are very different than what we had 10 years ago. Big data, analytics. So basically, Open Power is a consortium 
that IBM has formed. Now we have 25 members, Google, Samsung, and it basically enables you to, if, if you're running, if you want to have a custom server running in a Linux data center, open power. The ability to custom, develop custom servers with the whole ecosystem around it, as I said, we've got 21 partners already, and we've got dozens more that we are in conversations with. An example of how open standards go all the way down to the chip level. Now, the other area that Jim pointed to is OpenStack. We think OpenStack is incredibly important because it provides you the cloud operating system almost. It creates a level of abstraction between hardware with your compute network storage and the applications that you're going to run on top. And that abstraction is really, really valuable as you start moving to a software-defined world. So whether you're running OpenStack on an on-premise infrastructure or running it out in the cloud, it provides you that portability, that interoperability that we think is absolutely key. And this is another thing that Red Hat and IBM are very aligned on. If you look at the number of you know, contributions that Red Hat and IBM are making, we're in the top three. 85% of OpenStack implementations on Linux, KVM having a big, uh, a big success in this world, and will continue to partner with the communities and with Red Hat here. And you know, one thing about working with open source communities that uh, you know, I sort of personally experienced and we saw with Linux over a decade ago, that open source to us is all about coming to the communities with humility to say, look, we want to be a valued member and we want to contribute, right? We want to add value where we think we've got some unique capabilities to you know, accelerate the innovation. So what you see with OpenStack, of course, you know, we go in alphabetical orders going from E to F to G now to Icehouse. The number of people working on OpenStack inside of IBM has gone up sevenfold. We're making contributions in the area of security, quality, and what have you. But again, our approach with participation in communities is we're like anybody else. We have certain assets and some ideas that we want to bring. And what I love the most about participating with open communities is the meritocracy. The best ideas win, and that's why innovation is so much faster uh, in the open world. And then we also partner together, right? So when we look at Red Hat and IBM, we go to market. There's a lot of clients that buy solutions that have uh, components from IBM and Red Hat, and there's hundreds of clients out there, thousands of clients. But an example that I wanted to share with you, which I thought was almost interesting, you know, it's a German consulting firm, a small company, that was writing applications for cloud first on a mobile device, right? Nova Tech. And they wanted, you know, the application had embedded analytics for fleet of cars and trucks, basically for uh, gas uh, utilization and for route optimization. It was basically built in analytics. They came to us on a Friday afternoon. They said, look, I really want to understand the workload, create a pattern for it, and basically orchestrate this on, on a cloud. So based on a Linux operating environment, we've got a product called Smart Cloud Orchestrator, which is built on OpenStack. And it basically does orchestration supporting standards like Chef and Tosca. And we said, knock yourself out. 48 hours later, they had the pattern defined in Tosca. They had it running on software, which is IBM's infrastructure as a service, 48 hours. And then a few weeks ago, when we had our big conference in Vegas, we also announced Service Engage, which is IBM's service management offerings as a service running on software. And they, within a day, even had that integrated with their workloads. Examples of people moving with speed. In this case, speed to automate the patterns of how their workload ought to be uh, provisioned and, and run. Another area where we're partnering and putting a lot of focus is Power KVM. We just announced this. This ability to have KVM take full advantage of power, all the multi-threading, all the I.O., all the large memory access, because we think it's really important for people to create these hypervisors on whichever systems you're running on, in our case, power, 
And we're announcing that as, again, something that we're collaborating on and pretty excited about that. So look, at the end of the day, the reason Red Hat and IBM are such good partners is because the belief in the importance of open standards and open source as the way to accelerate innovation. And that's why I'm really here, and, and I'm really proud for 10 years, uh, this uh, event that we're having, and uh, for IBM to be the premier sponsor. Um, and again, we're going to have a great uh, party on Wednesday that I hope you guys uh, show up and join. But again, it's a great event, uh, and we are all sort of uh, thrilled to be here with you. And at the end of the day, if there are a few things that I'll just leave behind with you as far as IBM's point of view, we really believe that all the different disruptions that are taking place right now are creating once-in-a-generation opportunity for innovation and value creation. We believe composable business is where things are headed. Dynamic cloud is essential to a composable business, and open standards make dynamic clouds a possibility. Thank you very much for your time. All right, Deepak, thank you. All right, everyone. Well, as I said earlier on, this is our 10th anniversary. And we wanted to do something kind of fun to kick off the 10th anniversary. But at the same time, we also have things that we know work well. And so how do you combine those two? Who was here, or not here, but at the summit last year in Boston? Do you remember the entertainment we had on uh, Thursday night? Was that a fun event? I have to say, that was a logistical and amazing thing. So we were going to have an outdoor party on Thursday night at the summit, and it was pouring down rain like pouring down rain. At the last minute, we got a phenomenal venue. And we had, I have to say, probably one of the most fun evenings I've ever had at Red Hat. And so, to celebrate our first 10 years and to think about our future, we thought we would start this year by throwing a little party. So this is a little bit about the current 10 years, but hey, here's to the next 10 years of Red Hat. I'm getting off the stage. Woo!